Okay. Uh, so uh, Nick asked me to do a talk that would get your juices flowing, whatever that means, but no, no pressure then, really. Um, so um, this work, um, I, should, I should acknowledge my collaborators first of all. This work arises out of a collaboration with um, Camilo Ira. He's at CIGB in Havana. Um, so uh, I think coming here as a, as, a, as a Brit with a Cuban collaborator makes me slightly more nervous than I would in giving a talk, but hopefully you'll be broad-minded and open. And um, so uh, CIGB in Havana, uh, uh, they have a very good uh, genetics institute, but they don't have a lot of um, uh, evolutionary or e uh, ecological staff working in the BT field. So um, this work was a really opportunity for me to um, uh, get my teeth into some um, field data on uh, insect behavior and uh, how insects um, yes, how, we, how insects respond to, um, to BT crops. So David's already given a, a very nice um, introduction to the importance of behavior and the evolution of resistance. And this talk is uh, mostly going to focus on uh, on orbit position. <coughs> uh, and the other thing I should say is that um, uh, for people of you who are not uh, specialists in the BT field, um, it's quite we're, we're working on um, a spot um, on fall armyworm in, in, in Cuba. And one of the interesting um, reasons for studying uh, this particular species in this particular location is it's very close to Puerto Rico, where we had all the problems with uh, uh, field um, uh, field resistance to quite enough expressing crops. So hopefully there are some there may be some um, parallels and some um, um, lessons to be learned from, from this talk. OK, so uh, Nina's already um, given the basic overview of the high dose um, uh, refuge management strategy when we have um, uh, a transgenic crop in, in expressing a toxin, um, ideally a high enough dose that only a homozygous resistant insects will survive under conventional refuge, which is which is designed to supply, um, supply uh, susceptible genes, ensure that any, any rare emerging homozygotes will mate and produce a hopefully susceptible heterozygote, which then, and then maintains uh, phenotypic resistance. So I'm not going to go into that in any more detail, but as um, David's pointed out, this, this, this type of um, resistance management strategy rests on a number of assumptions, and some of those are indeed um, um, behavioral. So I'm not going to be addressing all of these. We, we all, well, many of you know that um, you know, things like having um, recessive resistance is very important. Having a low frequency resistance alleles is important, and proper refuge size. And we also have some behavior assumptions, for, exa for instance, random mating, and for, for instance, random oviposition. And so some people have looked at oviposition um, previously, but generally with the assumption that um, uh, adult insects may, for example, evolve behavioral resistance or, or in fact, avoid uh, BT crops, I which I suppose arises from the idea that, that you know, toxins are harmful to the insects and maybe the insects have some ability to detect harmful substances and avoid them. And this is certainly true of, of larval behavior. Um, I've seen this myself with, with diamondback moth and a number of other species. You can often see that larval, larvae will prefer to feed where BT isn't. But as far as I know, and I think David's talk uh, supported this. There's no real evidence. The adults can really tell that the toxins are there. So he's nodding gently. This is, good. this is a good sign. <laughs> <coughs> so the adults don't seem to be able to tell, but the larvae, the larvae can certainly avoid feeding on, on patches, of, patches, of, uh, patches of BT toxin or patches of, um, of bacillus itself. OK. Um, so um, this is a very quick introduction to fall armyworm. This is a. Um, this is a significant pest of, uh, I call it maize, you would call it corn, um, especially in the tropics. Um, its host range is mostly um, uh, graminaceous species. This includes wild grasses and, and graminaceous crops. And as I mentioned before, um, this is one of the, the, the first major report of field resistance to Bt crops within Puerto Rico. So what was the aim of this study? So the, 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 this study was, was, was um, set up um, uh, I was brought in quite late to the project after this field trial had been set up. The field trial was really was to try and test the efficacy of a, of a cry run maze. They've integrated a cry run maze event into a, into, a, into a local variety, and they wanted to assess how effective it was and uh, assess the impact of this, of this, of this maze plant on, um, on, on the behavior of the adults. And it was a, it's a very much traditional um, uh, 
sort of uh, field trial with replicated blocks. They've got a, a near isogenic conventional maize cultivar, so the or original source which was crossed into, um, um, which was then it was supplied the, the genetic background for the, for the transgenic BT crop. And they had a very detailed, intensive scouting um, uh, program to figure out where the insects were actually laying eggs over a, a number of growing seasons. So it's really, a, it's really a very much an observational study. Um, and I was just given the data set and said, here you are, Ben. Um, we think we've found something interesting. Can you, can you tell us what it is? OK, so, so this is where I came into the project. So um, to begin with, so to begin with, um, they scored all uh, vast numbers of maize plants um, over a number of years and assessed them very simply on a, on a damage index of, of, of one to four, where one is undamaged and four is, um, is uh, sort of 50% or more, or more leaf damage. And this, these data here just really represent, and they, they, they assess this data all the way through the season. And these data reflect six seasons, and this is just the first observation point in any season. So this is the first observation point. This is about, this occurs between 20 and 25 days after they've planted the corn. And pretty much uh, the BT crop um, very effectively pre prevents um, herbivory from fall larvae worms. So you can see here, um, the damage scores are uh, pretty much zero for BT um, every year, apart from this one year, summer, summer to 20, 2012, when we had when uh, the uh, population numbers of Spadoptera were, were very high. So you're, 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 you know, the, the, the toxin's doing its job, the crops are very clean and very undamaged, whereas um, in the refuge you have, you have a range of damage levels. I mean, these are um, depending on season and depending on the, the, the time. And this, this just represents the early observation point, but you can, do non you can throw non-parametric tests at these data for any um, observation point throughout any year, and you'll find um, uh, massive differences in damage levels between the conventional uh, refuge plants and the BT plants. And I'm assuming that's no great surprise to anyone. Okay, so then what we want to think about is, um, oh, this isn't working that well. Okay. So then what you want to think about is, is if you were a moth, where would you rather lay your eggs? Okay. <laughs> would you rather lay your eggs on a nice, clean plant like this one, would you rather lay your eggs on this plant down here? Any, any votes? Clean or dirty? Clean, yes. Okay, so not, not only have you got to worry about intraspecific uh, competition, but also as an ovipositing female, damaged plants tend to release volatiles. Those volatiles attract parasitoids. Okay, so, so already laying your eggs on a, on a, da on a plant with, with damage is, you know, you've you're, you're already got a plant that's attracting attention from natural enemies. So as, a, as an ovipositing female, Really, it's a good decision to try and lay your eggs on a clean plant. And this is what we find, basically, that in every season uh, for which we have data, sorry, we've lost my title, unfortunately, but essentially uh, the blue represents the BT plants, the red represents the uh, refuse plants, and every year we have more eggs per plant on the BT crop, okay, so uh, without fail. And um, you can very... They asked me to do the statistics, and I feel slightly cheated because I did a really simple Pearson's chi-squared test here, and it's a chi-squared value of 93, nearly. Okay, this is a really significant. Okay, this is a really, really robust result. But they really do prefer to lay eggs on the clean BT plants and not on the damaged plants. Okay, so I'm quite, I'm quite confident of that data point, and uh, of that, of that analysis. Um, the other thing to point out is that the preference is quite substantial. So if you focus on the um, on the, uh, the summer crops. So you get, you're getting um, between two and five-fold more eggs than you'd expect uh, through, random expect through random chance, through random expectation, in the BT crops than you would in the refuge. So two to up, to you know, up to five times more eggs. Um, I think that's in one of, I think that's that year there. So, but you know, two to three-fold more eggs in the BT was pretty, was, was not unusual. And uh, you could see the same here if the Erebon, if the, if, uh, if, we had a, if we had a different scale. Um, and the other thing we were able to do, so not only over the year do you get more eggs in the BT crop, is that the damage levels vary within the season. Yeah? So they had continual observations throughout the growing season, and the plants are either more or less damaged depending on, um, depending on when they're grown and how long the insects have had to, to feed on them. So we were able to uh, look at the change in preference 
as the crops are increasingly or decreasingly, decreasingly damaged over the season. And again, you can see um, this is over position preference. Over position preference is just, is just one, it's just a nice simple metric I invented. It's just really, I think, the, the difference in the square root transform number of eggs per plot. So it just, refer it just reflects the, 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 the sort of difference in eggs per plant. And this is just the mean refuge um, damage at that time point. So there's quite a very strong positive relationship. Um, um, there's some variation certainly around here, but I think these, this, this simple regression explains about 30% of the variation in the data. So there's quite, so you can clearly see that, um, that as, as crops are more damaged within the year, um, the, as the, sorry, as the refuge is more damaged within the year, the, 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 the fall army on have a stronger preference to lay eggs in, in BT. Um, also, quite importantly, the, the, the fit of this model, the, the intercept's not significantly different from zero. So it also suggests there's no innate preference but for, for, for the BT crops over, over the conventional crops. In other words, when both types of plants are undamaged, the, uh, the insects don't care. If everything is undamaged, they'll lay their eggs randomly. But as soon as the, the refuge starts to require some leaf damage, then we start having um, preferences emerging. So I think that, um, so I quite like that. So um, one of the obvious things for me to do to help you know, take this um, data a bit further was to try and plug this into, uh, plug these results into a simulation model. Uh, I should say I'm not really a modeler. Um, this is a very simple, um, uh, a simple model, which again, if you, uh, has a very simple structure population with just refugia and just transgenic crops. So the, the population dynamics are really completely determined by, by what's going on in your agro-ecosystem agro and the refuge. Um, size of the refuge determines a lot of the population dynamics in, in this system. Um, I didn't include grass wild hosts. Um, the data I'm showing today are all from a deterministic model. I have run a stochastic version of this which looks at just stochastically ad allocating adults to different genotypes, and you get pretty much the same effect. Um, the good, th the w one of the good things about this model is that we've got very nice data with which we can parameterize what's going on. So we've got good data on survival and opposition behavior. We've got some nice data on, for example, um, density-dependent mortality in the in the conventional refugia. And I've got some bounds. Um, so and. And I, and I just invented a metric for, 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 for opposition bi for bias, which is really sort of bounded by what we observed in the field. So we've had a maximum, uh, a, a very extreme end of a, a system where you have very high density, you have up to five-fold um, more eggs in the BT plants than you expect by chance. Hello. Um, we ha there are data on, um, so the scouting data include larval numbers. So we have field data on survival. So we can show that the, um, uh, and I think um, the data off the top of my head show that larval survival on the BT plants is, I think, at most 0.6% and goes way, way, way lower. So we have data. We can infer survival from, from, from the egg. So we, we don't. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. 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 So yeah, uh, uh, a simple simulation model. Um, and I threw in some, I, I mostly was interested in, in, in modeling uh, things which would um, uh, look at population dynamics because clearly levels of damage are determined by how many insects are around. So the population dynamics of the insects seem to be the interesting thing to look at here. I threw in um, very simple assumptions of, uh, based on um, uh, Nick Storer's work on uh, Cry1F resistance. So the, the uh, resistance is entirely recessive. There's a small recessive fitness cost and I didn't really play around with the genetics at all. I mostly just focused on the, on the, on the population dynamics. And I considered two main scenarios. One is a scenario in which we have um, natural enemy control um, of uh, our fall army worm in a refuge. This is just represented by a, a random parasitoid. Actually, it's not entirely random because it is actually on a corn plant. It's just a parasitoid. Uh, and we have another management scenario 
Um, when we have a tractor, this represents that this is represents that you're, for example, you're spraying pyrethroids in your conventional refugia. So two different management scenarios. This one uh, we can parameterize quite well from that um, survival data we have in the field, and this one is just based on a sort of uh, spray thresholds, which I've um, dragged off um, various uh, US uh, outreach um, uh, extension services who recommend various um, spray thresholds across the US. And so what is the impact of um, non-random of, of a position? And in this model, pretty much it's bad, really, because um, the more you're laying eggs in your BT crop, the worse your refuge is. Okay? You know, the, the avoidance of, uh, of the refuge plants basically weakens your refugia. So um, this is a, a dashed line represents random of a position. And as you might expect, in a sort of a standard model, as you increase refuge size, uh, the number of generations that are required to, to, to what the, the number of generations until resistance frequency each hits 50%, um, goes up nicely until you have fairly stable um, management of resistance at about a sort of 25% uh, refuge. Uh, and with non-random overposition, the situation is much worse. You have a much uh, a slower, uh, or your, 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 your delay of resistance is much weaker as you increase refuge size. You never really get to that nice, um, stable equilibrium. And in the spray refu refuge model, sorry, the, 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 yeah, the spray refuge model, it's much worse. You can increase your refuge size as much as you want, and it really doesn't help resistance management at all. And the reason simply is, is that in this model, the size of your refuge is driving the population size of your pests. Yeah? So the more pests you have, the more damage you have in your refuge, and the less valuable the refuge is. So arguably, it's an artifact of the model, but also arguably, um, there are quite a lot of pet special species that show this kind of dynamics at, at, at various stages of, of the development or in different places or in, in different years. So that's, th that's the main limiting um, simplification of the model, but the, um, but the results suggest that, you know, this is quite bad. Um, so not only is, is, is this kind of non-random of, of a position bad, but um, the type of, um, type of management you have on your refuge also affects how bad it's going to be. Um, one of the reasons is, is simply because um, so this, is just, um, this is just your pest population size. So in our spray threshold model, as I said before, um, as you increase population size through increasing your refuge, um, the, um, the, strength, the, 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 the strength of which the, the insects avoid uh, the refuge goes up and up and up and up and up. So the refuge avoidance factor, this is just the, um, as I said before, so when this is at three, you get three times more eggs in the BT crop than you would expect by chance. So when it's at one, you have random of a position. So under the natural enemy model, because we've got essentially a power law, um, uh, density dependence going on, the, the, you know, the survival, the survival of, the, of, the, of the insects in the refuge is, is, is um, driven by a log density. The, the, the opposition bias doesn't really go up that much as you increase density, but it, when you have sprayed, when you have um, pesticide spraying in your refuge, then really the population dynamics still go up and up, up. it still goes up as you, as you increase refuge size, at least in this model, anyway. Um, so the other things um, I kind of looked at, I did, a, I did sensitivity analysis, which, for example, um, looked at changing spray uh, thresholds for, um, for adults in refugia. So if you really try and minimize the damage in your refuge by, by spraying, as soon as you see kind of any adults flying around, is that going to help your resistance management? Doesn't really seem to have an effect, I suppose, because the more and more you spray a, a refuge, the less and less useful it is. So um, changing the spray thresholds didn't really seem to make a, make a lot of difference. Having no density dependence is really bad. Okay? <laughs> Having no density dependence at all um, uh, in, in terms of natural it really does affect um, how, how big a problem this is. And um, I did play around with other functions, but I, I think I prefer to talk about the one which is based on the field data. Hello. <laughs> Um, no, I pretty m um, no, I pretty much uh, these data. Well, for example, this stuff is all 
all taken from um, parameter values before resistance gets to 50%. So after 50%, you know, most of some of the assumptions of the model tend to fall apart. But you know, by the time you've got that far, it's pretty bad anyway. So um, I didn't really, I didn't worry about um, measuring the damage in the BT crop as resistance evolved. I assume that by the time you've got that much resistance, you know, it's it's all a party's over anyway. If that's fair. Hello. Do you have any idea of the scale that this behavior operates? Like we do a lot of work, in, you know, where you can put two plants together, say one had fire delivery, one hasn't, and the insect will make that decision very well in a petri dish in the lab. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get out to the field because they're herbivorized plants three plants away. They can't make the decision anymore. Uh. The decisions often, I think, on very local scales, so they might move to the next plant or something. But is it really going to affect? Here at Fall Island, when we're in the field, are you really going to just fly away from the field, or are you just going to pick maybe a plant that has a little less of it? Um, I would say, I mean, this is a this is an experimental plot, okay? So it's an, it's an experimental field. It's not of the same size as you might imagine some of the field sizes you get in the U.S. <laughs> they were big, but but there's still blocks of you know, 10 to 12 meters, from, from if I remember right, from the, from the field study design. So they're, you know, they're fairly substantial. Um, so yeah, if you did a bigger field, I mean, I don't know, but with a bigger field, you got more volatiles, haven't you? You know, there'd be a great big, you know, there'd be a much bigger signal. Um, and there's quite, there's quite interesting reports. If you go back into the literature, so I should, before I go on to the, the, the next bit of modeling, um, there, there is, there is, as you say, there are there is existing data show that showing that Spodoptera um, um, frugiperda is averse to damaged plants. So that, that data is already out there. But also there's data, there's there's, there's anecdotal reports reports going back to the 50s and 60s that showing that Spodoptera does wacky things at high density. So when when you get loads of damaged plants and a massive outbreak, they start laying eggs on farm buildings and you know. Um, your hat and you know rocks, you know they they really you know suggest that, that that this is quite this is you know you can get quite large scale behavioral changes at very high density, so yeah, I you know I don't know. I, I'm just wondering if like a general uh, idea. Are we thinking about behavior on a local scale and then we're just scaling that up? Uh, is consistent always. I mean, this is just a question I guess for the group. Um, I think you need more data, but I I'm guessing this would impact large scale behavior. That would be my hunch. Uh, uh, can I just? I'll just get to the. I guess get to the next. Get through the next slide. Then you can. <laughs> so um, the other thing I did, which was kind of important for um, dynamics, is to look at female fecundity, and um, uh, you can see here. So here again, this is um, generation until resistance hits 50%, and so blue is good. Blue is a good resistance management. You can see in a random over position model, as you increase refuge size, resistance management goes up. There are some uh, little uh, spikes here. This is because um, um, the basically the, the reproductive rate of the pest is very low under these parameter values. So you don't really get the chance for any homozygotes to form. But in general, as the refuge size goes up, um, uh, resistance management goes up, and fecundity doesn't really have any impact. However, um, in the damage avoiding model, fecundity does have some, imp some impact. But you know, the overriding impression is generally here, uh, random opposition, blue, good. Non-random opposition, bad. <laughs> and as you have, as you have some, um, as you have some increases in f in fecundity, uh, the the um, it gets slightly worse generally. So fecundity can ha high fecundity, higher reproductive rates can make the, um, uh, the 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 problem of sort of damage avoiding opposition even even worse. Um, so. To, to sum up, so I think, um, I think I'm right in saying that people have looked at opposition behavior before and opposition preferences, but I don't really think people have considered damage and leaf damage as an additional factor in, in driving opposition behavior. So um, um, I think that's, an Im that, that's something we really need to look at a bit in a bit more detail. So opposition is, is certainly not random in, in, in this species. Um, and the the other thing to say is that it's not random in a lot of other species as well. So if you, if you actually look at the data on where Lepidoptera lay eggs and whether they're averse to leaf damage, the literature throws up some quite familiar names. So other Spodoptera species, I think Heliothis um, um, 
uh, European corn borer, all these species show behaviors in which they will avoid laying eggs on, um, on damaged plants to some level. So I really think that this, this um, and this phenomena can really, really undermine quite dramatically how good your refuge are. So I think it might be a good idea for people to, to, to look at their own systems and see, as you said, how, how true it is and at what kind of spatial scales it plays out. And as I said, I mean, you could, you could take apart my model and uh, ask whether, how have I, you know, how, how, well, has, how well have I uh, simulated this kind of behavior. But, um, I mean, the main thing to say is that we're, the bounds of the behavior are quite well informed by the field data. So the exact functions you fit to this behavior probably don't have that. I would, my hunch is they probably won't have that big an effect. The point is that uh, the, 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 the non-random of the position can have a really quite serious um, impact on the, on the, on the high-dose refuge strategy. Um, yes, and the other thing to say is that I think um, even if, if this is uh, a serious problem, I think there are things that can be done to minimize its impact. So for example, um, the modeling suggests that high pest population density is bad. So if you can uh, reduce pest population density in, in other ways, for example, by habitat management or pupae busting or other, or other systems, then you could possibly minimize the impact of this phenomenon. There are also apparently um, uh, corn crops that, that uh, vary in their production of maize volatiles when they're damaged. So it is th th there may be, for example, crop breeding solutions to, um, to uh, the production of volatiles on damage, which would then which would, would help mitigate this problem. Um, but the other thing to say is, yes, I think, I think damage avoiding behavior is, is quite well documented in a number of key species, so it, it may be worth investigating this a bit further. Okay, was that juicy enough? Good. <laughs> <laughs>